Welcome to HRS TV. My name's Louise Segan, cardiologist and PhD fellow in EP from Melbourne, Australia. I'm delighted to be joined by my colleague, friend and um, esteemed guest, Dr. Sadeep Prabhu, who's Associate Professor in Cardiology and Electrophysiology, who's going to talk to us today about two important studies in patients with AF and concurrent heart failure. Welcome, Sunny. Thank you, Louise. Uh, it's a great pleasure to be here on HRS TV. Uh, my name's uh, Sandy Prabhu. I'm a staff cardiologist at the Alfred Hospital in Melbourne uh, and a senior research fellow at the uh, Baker Research Institute also in Melbourne. Um, and yeah, we have some uh, exciting new studies that uh, have been a lot of work and have finally uh, uh, reached, the reached the point where we can present them uh, in, uh, to the wider audience and we're very excited to talk about them. Perfect. Thank you, Sunny. Take us back a step. How did you become interested in AF and heart failure research? Yeah, so this uh, sort of extended back to probably 2014 when I started uh, EP training. Um, the AF and heart failure group at that stage were kind of considered patients that were a bit too hard to ablate because they had, you know, big atria, they had other comorbidities, and the heart failure they thought was a, you know, a, a, a hurdle to offering them rhythm control rather than actually something that was a primary problem. And then what we tried to show in that first camera study, which we published in 2017, we're kind of interested in this chicken and egg phenomenon, like is the AF driving the heart failure? Is the heart failure causing the AF? The AF? And we used MRI as our tool to kind of distinguish this. And we, we had a thought at that stage that, you know, perhaps those patients without scar might be the ones who have a true AF mediated cardiomyopathy. And, um, and so we, 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 did the, we did that study and we, at that stage was actually not that easy to find patients with heart failure who needed, who were happy to have ablation. And uh, it took a while to, to get the patients we needed, but we, we, we did the study and we showed that we actually had quite, you know, great results with uh, improvements in ejection fraction in those patients. Um, and even those who had some scar seemed to do well as well, perhaps not as well as those without scar. And so that, that really um, helped, and that along with other studies that came out at the same time, the Castle AF series, I think it started to establish heart failure as a kind of separate, separate category of patients with AF who should be treated differently. And then that was really where the interest grew. And then we kind of shaped studies around that to answer questions that are kind of missing in the literature and that's kind of where camera two and um, and uh, the withdrawal AF studies uh, you know come into it. I, I'm glad you mentioned castle AF obviously we know heart failure is not all equal and there's very diverse populations within the heart failure group overall and castle AF obviously was a, um, a population with somewhat advanced cardiomyopathy a lot of patients had devices. We know that that showed a significant benefit also with catheter ablation, but there was that subgroup with a more severe cardiomyopathy, less than ejection fraction, less than 25%, that seemed to not do quite as well. So how does that then fit into the design of the camera MRI2 study? Tell us a bit about that. Yeah, so camera MRI2 was a study where we were interested in patients who now had coexisting structural heart disease. So camera MRI 1, we focused entirely on those patients with otherwise unexplained cardiomyopathy and uh, we excluded those patients who had known structural heart disease such as myocardial infarction or other disease processes that could cause scarring in their, in their myocardium um, the, other than just non-ischemic cardiomyopathy. However, in camera 2, we wanted to include all comers. So, we actually wanted patients with uh, previous myocardial infarcts. We wanted patients with other uh, structural heart disease, and it was those patients in this, on this instance, that we randomised to ongoing medical rate control, or to rhythm control with catheter ablation. And we had a comparator arm of those patients without scar, who we'd already shown in camera one do very well with catheter ablation. We used that as an observational arm to compare the ablation outcomes on those patients with scar and those patients without scar, uh, and so. Basically, we, we took these patients and we followed them for 12 months um, and they had cardiac MRIs at both baseline and follow-up to see what the outcome was in terms of heart failure, heart failure improvement, uh, ejection fraction. As you know, we had other parameters as well, looking at uh, physiological markers of heart failure, symptoms, quality of life. And we wanted to see if those patients still had the same benefits of those compared to those patients with low or minimal scar that we showed in camera one. And so tell me, um, does that mean that you know you, sh you were able to show uh, results were presented in ESC? Congratulations! Um, you were able to show that patients with scar still benefit from catheter ablation early on compared to best medical therapy. Does that mean anyone who has any amount of scar should be offered an AF ablation? 
Yeah, it's a good question. So what we showed in camera two is that these patients who had, we'd say a moderate burden of scar, so the average scar burden was around 11%, um, which is consistent with uh, other studies that have looked at patients with scar undergoing catheter ablation. In fact, that's probably on the higher end. Uh, what we found is that those patients had a, still around a 20% improvement in ejection fraction. They, their absolute improvement was not as high as those who had no scar, so the absolute uh, EF that you can get to following ablation was still not as high, but the improvement from baseline uh, really kind of mirrored that we've seen in patients without scar. So I think what it was telling us is that even though these patients that have scar burdens, the capacity of the ventricle to respond to rhythm control or the impact of AF on their ejection fraction is still quite significant and they and that these patients still um, improve substantially with rhythm control with catheter ablation. Anyway, this was also shown not just the, the uh, ejection fraction but their BNP reduced, their LA size reduced, their functional capacity uh, in terms of six minute walk tests and also VO2 max uh, all showed significant improvements as, along with quality of life. So it was a across the board improvement in all kind of measures of heart failure and also symptoms that we saw as well. So um, the question is how does this fit into the other literature out there? I mean, I, I always find the Castle HTX study really interesting. These are patients who were unwell enough to be referred to a tertiary in, uh, institution to be commenced on advanced heart failure therapy such as LVAD or even transplant. Um, and even in that group who you would assume have a fairly high scar burden, um, the, the scar burden at, at group is, is not reported, but um, in our experience, those patients probably have very high scar burdens and those patients still still benefit. So I think what we, what we show is that patients with mild to moderate scar and patients with even significant scar all seem to have at least some improvement ejection fraction uh, and that leads to, you know, to significant benefits for that patient, um, you know, both in terms of the quality of life but also their symptoms uh, and probably, um, as we've seen in the larger studies, uh, the mortality benefit as well. So I guess keeping all that in mind, we know these patients have a prognostic advantage with AF ablation or rhythm control. So what do you think is the time frame for these patients? You know, some patients typically with AF and heart failure, they're not symptomatic with respect to the AF per se. So they may the AF may not be detected early on. Is there a time frame where you might say this patient's no longer suitable, they've had AF for 10 years continuously? Yeah, it's a good question. I mean, I think that uh, the time to ablation in the heart failure population really should be treated differently to those patients without heart failure. I think once you're in continuous heart failure and you have associated LV dysfunction, the clock is ticking a little bit uh, and that if you're leaving it for years and years and years, you do get to the point where perhaps your outcomes are not as good uh, in terms of um, you know the, the, the efficacy of ablation in maintaining sinus rhythm. Um, I think though with these patients that the goalposts are quite different. So, so these patients, um, your ablation in these patients is, is a heart failure therapy. So as long as we feel that there's a contribution of AF to their heart failure, I think you really should be looking at why you shouldn't be ablating these patients. And, and you know, it's, a, it's an ablation strategy. It's not necessarily a one-stop fix. So when you take on these patients with heart failure for ablation, you've got to commit to a strategy and, and it may not be a once-off procedure. They may, have a, they may have to have a second procedure. They may come back in an organised tachycardia that would not, you know, warrant further procedure. Um, so I think when you, when you take these patients on, even though they may have had long-standing persistent AF, um, I think accepting that it's a strategy that may involve multiple procedures, um, I think the goalposts are slightly different from, from patients without, without heart failure. Be prepared to take on patients even with long-standing persistent a AF. You know, if you have persistent AF for, for perhaps, you know, 15, 20 years, perhaps at that circumstance it's failed, uh, the, you know, the ship has sailed. But I think um, if there's a clinical evidence that the patient's heart failure is related to their AF, perhaps they had a cardioversion maintaining sinus rhythm for only a month, but had significant improvements and perhaps, you know, a measurable improvement in ejection fraction. Um, if that was the case, I still think catheter ablation, given that the procedure is becoming much more streamlined and efficient and safer. Uh, I don't think um, I would necessarily say that, that we wouldn't offer it to them um, uh, so long as we thought it was contributing to the heart failure. So I think in summary it sounds like we think that we now have enough mounting evidence to suggest that AF ablation should be considered an additional pillar of AF management. 
Pivoting across a little bit to the other pillars of AF and heart failure management, we know we've got the five pillars of drug therapy. Tell us a bit about the Withdraw AF study, if you can summarise it, and, and what do you think are the key takeaway messages from that study? Yeah, so with the Withdraw AF study was, it, it was a study that we've uh, just finished, uh, really kind of looking at a unique group of patients with AF and heart failure. So now we're looking at the patients who are really the pure AF mediated cardiomyopathy, really one of those patients where AF was the only and very likely cause of their of their cardiomyopathy and uh, have now had a fully recovered heart function after the establishment of rhythm control. And the vast majority, 97% of those patients had that with catheter ablation. So these patients, they had EFs less than 40% in AF, improved to normal back in sinus rhythm. They had no scar on MRI, uh, so to, to reduce the chance of there having been any other cause for their heart failure. Um, and the question that we had is that all these patients get guideline directed heart failure therapy um, as, as directed by guidelines and there's really no guidance as to how long they need this for and, um, and the question with these patients having a fully reversible cause we think of their heart failure, you know, do they actually need these heart failure therapies in the long term and, and we, we designed this study to sort of safely, um, safely withdraw them from these medications and monitor them closely both with regards to their rejection fraction also their rhythm. Uh, and see whether there, there was an impact on the rejection fraction by withdrawing these therapies. Um, and and um, we found that in the vast majority of these patients, well over 90% of these patients, um, you could safely withdraw therapy in a staged and controlled manner uh, and follow them up for six months um, and they maintain their rejection fraction over 50% or, um, in the normal range despite being off medications. And we, we designed it in a double crossover fashion so each patient act as their own control to show that being on the drug or being off the drug really had no impact on their ejection fraction. Um, there were some patients who had who, who had relapses, uh, a small number. Um, we looked at that in a bit of detail and showed that um, perhaps there was some you know subtle indicators with their pre-existing ejection fraction that may predict that. Um, but certainly the hypothesis generating um, generated from this study suggests that in the vast majority of patients, perhaps heart failure therapy in the long term may not be needed. Yeah. Fantastic, Sunny. Well, thanks very much for those amazing insights. Just a quick take home for the audience. What do you think is the future frontiers in terms of AF and heart failure research? What's the next big project? I think the next big project is to really understand the mechanism behind these patients. So, I mean, the vast majority of patients with AF don't present in heart failure. Um, this is an important subgroup, but still a subgroup nonetheless. And, and I think we need to work on ways of how we can find these patients earlier. You know, how, what is it about the way these patients present? Are there any clues before they present with heart failure that these patients are at risk of developing AF mediated cardiomyopathy? Um, and perhaps rather than having to be in the situation where we need to treat their heart failure as well, perhaps if we can get them early enough and um, you know focus on early rhythm control, perhaps these patients might do really well. Um, that would, for me, that's an interesting area, and also. Heart failure preserved ejection fraction, a very different sort of category of patient, Very, uh, some very exciting work that's on the way in that space as well. So I think they're the two areas I think that are still kind of uncharted in this, in this space. It sounds like lots more work to be done. I congratulate you on your, all your efforts to date and we'll pass back to the studio.